The gentleman from Fairfax, Ms. Watts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do not wish to discuss rhetoric. There are times when people get a little carried away with the seriousness of how they take an issue. But I do want to address the Virginia way, the constitutional way that we have all pledged to defend. This has been a very long process from the opening session in January to special session to where we are today. But where we are on the budget is absolutely within the processes that have been part of our Constitution, as the minority leader laid out, essentially since its beginning. The governor has the right to veto, period. And that is where we are on the budget. For the first time it came to his desk, he looked at it, and he has the right to veto. We are not defending, as it was said, that we must pre pre defend the legislative prerogatives and the precedent of undergutting the legislative prerogatives. This is not about that. In fact, that was established back when I was doing League of Women Voters stuff back in the 70s with Brault where on that decision, the outcome of that decision was to give the legislative body, for the first time, the ability to override a veto. Up until that point, the balance of power of the Virginia way was that the governor took the budget and he could line-item veto. We have had since the Constitution was amended, we have had the ability to come in a reconvened session as a body, engage in debate, and decide whether or not we will sustain or override that veto. It is as simple as that. The governor, in each of these eight vetoes, is not in any sense overreaching in the powers that have been granted to him and the balance of powers to veto these items for us to have the debate of whether or not we are going to sustain or override the veto. We are here to do the business as the procedures have been laid out. It is not a matter of rhetoric. Since I have taken the floor, I'm going to conclude with one statement. I have had the privilege in my service to sit on occasion in the governor's mansion and have that heavy silver and just may be amazed that I am sitting here at the governor's table having dinner, having breakfast. But within a couple of weeks, I will be flying to, after one or two transfers, to downstate Illinois. And I will have meals with my sister. And those meals will be put together by the food stamps that are available for those who are in the facility where she is on Social Security and food stamps. And the facility where she is, that's all that is available. And I can assure you that men menu is minimal. But I will be with my sister and I will be with the other people that are there at the table. And I will know the dignity of their lives. I will know the dignity of my sister who raised a intellectually, developmentally disabled son who was left when his mother died in a car accident that he was part of when he was five years old. And she has raised him to age 50. And she has made all kinds of sacrifices. And her life has not worked out as my life worked out. I will be voting for Medicaid expansion. I will be voting for health care for people like my sister who have lived a life of dignity, of honor, of moral courage to do the right thing. And we must do the right thing by them and not tell them that I'm sorry. The church is full and we aren't going, we're, we're not going to let anybody else in. Well, for these people, 
having health care is as essential as their own sense of worth, their own relationship with their creator. And how dare we say that you don't have, we don't have room for you. We're not going to try to help give you this most basic element, health care.